Hey, class. So, um, Catherine Ann Porter, otherwise known as uh, Callie Porter, uh, she changed her name to Catherine Ann when she became a writer, uh, was born in a little town in Texas. Um, I think her mother died when she was like two. She had some siblings. Uh, they ended up living with their very stern grandmother in extreme poverty in another part of Texas. Um, Porter got married as soon as she was 16. And, um, but then that didn't really, being a domestic housewife didn't really work out. So, you know, so she split, I think when she was about 25 or so, got a divorce and traveled around and started working as like a, a newspaper reporter <clears throat> and ended up in Mexico with a lot of Mexican artists and other intellectuals and writers and got involved in revolutionary politics. Now, you know, you might want to just do a quick Wikipedia search and see what's going on in Mexico in terms of, you know, the revolution and the Zapatistas and all that stuff. But I don't really have time for that, you know, right the second. You can just check it out. <clears throat> the point is, this short story, Flowering Judas especially, is uh, she kind of takes, like, aspects from reality in her life and interweaves them in her story and her completely fictional stories to give them a very you know, realistic flavor. You can see that, um, you know, even though we're moving on into modernism here, you know, she very much has the regional, uh, you know, regionalism and realism, uh, you know, is kind of grounded aspects of, of her writing. And um, you also see a lot of symbolism in this, you know, as Braga, uh, Bragioni, Bragioni here, <coughs> um, you know, uh, he and and his outfits and, for instance, uh, Laura and her plain drab kind of uh, tannish, quote unquote, uniform are kind of symbolizing the way that some people are holding on to the virtues, the political virtues of their side in this term, in this case, the revolutionaries. And some people have kind of sold out. <laughs> or aren't true to the cause symbolized by Bragioni here. Um, so, you know, in that way, there's a lot of highly symbolic stuff. And if you read through the short story, you know, you'll kind of see, you know, like, for instance, the fact that Bragioni is this, you know, bard with a guitar that's, you know, constantly trying to woo her, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, symbolic of, you know, kind of the show and dance he's putting on. He's not a, He's not true to his ideals. <clears throat> anyway, so you have a lot of symbolism in that regard from modernism, you know, as one of the modernist traits. Um, Porter was pretty meticulous with these stories. So each detail, these scenarios, the dialogue, everything she went over with a fine tooth, uh, tooth, uh, uh, fine tooth comb many times, um, she really drew on you know, the real experience of her life. Um, she wasn't technically a feminist writer, but she did divide, you know, did, she did explore a lot of um, the tension that, that exists in, in women's lives in the modern era. Um, so a lot of the themes here are, you know, lust, betrayal, of course, politics is pretty obvious. <laughs> and um, some of the themes are going into, for instance, uh, the reality of mixed motives um, and the difference between that pure political idealism and the kind of egotistical opportunism that comes in politics and leadership and government, um, you know. And so we have it like a very, we have, this is kind of like the comic book 300 in many ways. It seems to be a very simple narrative on the surface, but there's actually many layers of politics and symbolism kind of rooted throughout. So that's what I want you to look for as you read this. And there are an abundance of analysis tools online. If you have trouble with it, they're everywhere. It's super famous, just like all the other works.